Hello, welcome to the Thursday, May 17th, 2018 edition of the Sands and its Storms and its Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Today's critical vulnerability affects Linux systems, in particular Red Hat and its derivatives like CentOS. The problem originates from the DHCP client. So what happens here is that a malicious DHCP server would send a string to the DHCP client that's then being passed to shell scripts that leads to arbitrary code execution. DHCP clients had similar vulnerabilities in the past. The problem with DHCP is that it receives a number of different items from a DHCP server and then passes them to various scripts that reconfigure the network or other parameters. And of course, these scripts typically have to run as root in order to do their job. Now, in order to be affected by this vulnerability, you have to connect to a network with a malicious DHCP server. So this vulnerability could be exploited by an attacker who already has a foothold in a particular network by essentially setting up a rogue DHCP server. Or then of course, if you do have Linux client systems, laptops and the like that connect to wireless access points and the like. But again, note that this affects Red Hat Enterprise Linux 6 and 7 with that probably also CentOS. So this doesn't affect things like Ubuntu or Android, which you're more likely going to find on a desktop or a laptop. Universal plug and play or the underlying protocol, the SSDP or a simple service discovery protocol have been abused for many years now in denial of service attacks. Like so many UDP based protocols, you can send a small request from a spoofed IP to a vulnerable system and it will reply with a large packet which can then be used to amplify and of course also anonymize a denial of service attack. But Imperva now discovered a different use of universal plug and play to launch denial of service attacks. The reason universal plug and play exists is to allow devices behind NAT to reconfigure routers to forward certain ports to the device behind NAT. So for example, if you do have a web-based camera and you would like to access it from the internet, then the camera is able to set up the router to forward a port from the router to the camera. And if you wonder how authentication works in this case, well, there usually isn't really any authentication. The router is supposed to only allow these requests from inside the network. But some routers apparently don't even check if the port forwarding rule is actually redirecting traffic to an internal IP address. So what's happening here is that the attacker is scanning the internet for vulnerable routers. And according to Shodan, there are about 1.3 million of them. Then they configure the port forwarding to forward a given port to the denial of service victim's IP address. So essentially they're configuring the router as a reflector. Now there is no amplification in this attack. However, the attacker doesn't actually have to spoof any traffic because the reflector will NAT traffic to the victim of the denial of service attack. Also, while all the other reflective denial of service attacks are limited to certain ports at which we have these servers listening, well, in this case, the attacker can pick whatever port they want in order to reflect the packets to or to send the packets from. So pretty neat new attack that of course makes defending a bit more difficult. You have to be more flexible here in how you're then setting up your filtering rules. But in general, I don't think it's really a game changer. It's probably not any worse than any of the existing reflective attacks, in particular, if you take into account amplification. And earlier this week, I reported how crypto coin miners have been found in the Ubuntu Snap Store. Well, Ubuntu has now responded to uh, these issues. And essentially what they're saying, yes, it's actually okay to distribute a miner application from the Ubuntu Snap Store, but you have to clearly state that what you are distributing is a crypto coin miner. And with the next and last item, I wasn't really sure if I should include it because it 
it does sound a little bit like a marketing ploy, but nevertheless, seems to be important enough. It's a vulnerability that apparently affects about 10% of iOS apps and very likely also affects a large number of Android applications. The vulnerability was found by Pangu team who has a pretty good reputation in finding vulnerabilities. Their product after all is a vulnerability scanner for mobile applications. And what they state is that applications vulnerable to this new issue are allowing arbitrary remote code execution if an attacker can inject data into the network traffic that the application is exposed to. However, that's pretty much all the detail that they are providing. They also have a list of vulnerable applications and essentially they're stating that they're not willing to release any more details until they made contact with a good number of vulnerable applications. Some of them are very large sort of brand name applications. So they're trying really to expose users to this vulnerability before patches are available. And I guess they figure based on the large number of applications that are affected that going public in this form gives them the best chance to do so. Well, that is it for today. So thanks again for listening and talk to you again tomorrow.